The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Uh, this is Sam, Blackleg Spade, the third most dangerous gambler on the Barbary Coast. Oh, Sam, not horses again. Horses, women, and the gaming tables, Effie, the diversions of the elite. Well, divert yourself with this, Sam. The phone company has sent the pink notice. Uh huh. Pay it no mind, sweetheart. We are healed. We have hit the cashier's cage, annexed the pot, broken the bank, and we're standing on velvet. Sam, are you sober? Uh, definitely velvet. Hmm. Warm, too. Sam, from where are you calling from? You're wrong, Effie. It's a drugstore. Stay where you are. I'll be right down to deal out my report on the hot hundred grand caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. It's smart to buy things the whole family can use, isn't it? That's why I say it's smart to buy Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. To mom, to dad... To the children, Wild Root Cream Oil is really a friend indeed. Non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil with lanolin grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. I hope you have a big family-sized bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil in your home. Get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Date, uh, September 19, 1948. To uh, robbery detail, San Francisco Police, Attention Sergeant Walsh. Uh, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Uh, dear Joe, here's the rundown on that hot hundred grand. It started pleasantly enough when my secretary, Miss Effie Perrine, cute little mouse, eased into my private office, closed the door behind her, and leaned back against it with that air of pained resignation, which generally means there's a customer outside that she doesn't approve of, but that I'll see her anyway. It's up to you, Sam. She's very well dressed, and I imagine she can afford you. How do you uh, deduce that? Well, she dropped her purse. I didn't get time to count it all, but there was a $100 bill on top. Well, sure, in, Effie. Sam. I... Go ahead, say it. Oh, I don't know, Sam. Sometimes, well, there's just money. No. No, that's one of the reasons I hire you. What's the matter with it? Nothing. That's just it, Sam. She's very good looking, mm -hmm. cultivated, and very kind and considerate. And she seems sincerely troubled. You mean her act is a little too good? I felt that too, Sam. Thanks, Angel. I'll keep that in mind. Tell her to come in. All right, Sam. Mr. Spade will see you, Mrs. Kilcoy. Thank you. Thank you for seeing me, Mr. Spade. My pleasure. Uh, won't you sit down? Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm Lorraine Kilcoy, Mr. Spade. It's about my husband, Leonard Kilcoy. Husband? Oh. We've only been married a short time. It was a quiet ceremony at the San Cedro Mission. Mm -hmm. Leonard didn't want to subject me to any publicity. The difference in our ages, you know? You mean you want me to keep it a secret? Oh, no. No, except for the newspapers, of course. Naturally, all of Leonard's friends know. Oh, he doesn't have many, from what I've heard. I've thought it strange, too, that such a prominent man should have such a small circle of acquaintances. I met him only a short time before I married him. He's been very kind and absolutely devoted to me and... I suppose I should feel ashamed of myself for, for coming to you. But there are so many things about him that are mysterious that I... Sometimes I... I, I can't seem to find my handkerchief. Here. Kleenex. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I uh, take it you're not a San Francisco girl. No. No, I met him at a dude ranch. Well, uh, maybe I can clear up some of your mysteries for free. The reason your husband doesn't have many friends is because they keep dropping dead. I don't understand you. 
Oh, forget it. He's a big public servant. He's built a lot of sidewalks. The streets of this city are paved with his good intentions. His name is on a thousand manhole covers. If the names of his former business associates land on headstones, it's nothing to me. I got my own racket. Well, what? I think my husband is paying blackmail to someone. Uh Uh-huh. And upon what do you base your suspicions, Mrs. K? It started about a month ago. He began withdrawing large sums from our joint account. First it was 10000 then then 20000 and last week, 50000 mm-hmm. and, and this morning, he closed out the balance of the account. $100,000. Yeah, well, he's got it to spend, Mrs. Kilcoy. Well, I, I won't pretend the money doesn't interest me, but what's behind it, Mr. Spade? Each time he withdraws these cash sums, he, he leaves the house without a word to me. And sometimes doesn't return until dawn. My husband is not fond of nightlife, Mr. Spade. Only a desperate situation could induce him to leave the house after dark. <clears throat> yeah, so I've heard. They say that's how he kept his health as long as he has. All right, uh, you want me to trail him, find out what he does with the money. Just one question. Why'd you pick me for the job? I... I why, your reputation That's is... local. You say you're new in San Francisco. Well, I I do read the local papers. Your picture was in only two weeks ago. Yeah, well, that caver didn't help my reputation. I like your looks. A nice, honest face. A man I could trust. Well, don't buy that. And I'm sentimental, too. Your picture reminded me of someone who is very dear to me. My brother. Of course, you're nothing like him, really, but, but you do look alike... I suppose that sounds like a silly woman's reason for... Yeah. What's your address? Well, I have a little place of my own out on Divisadero. The Balboa Apartments near Normandy Terrace. Mm-hmm. You'd mm-hmm. better keep in touch with me there. I don't want Leonard to know. The Kilcourse Mansion is at 1316 Clarendon. 1316. Mm-hmm. He returns from his office around six in the evening. Do you have a car? No. I need one? Well, I don't know where he may go. Now, here are the keys to my car. It's parked in front of the main entrance, a gray Plymouth. He won't recognize the car. My, my, it's my brother's. Now, about your fee. A hundred bucks now. If I need more, I'll leave you now. I had an uneasy feeling I would need more. The last detective that tried to follow Leonard Kilcourse had hospital insurance. I don't. But I'm a gambler at heart, so I parked Lorraine's Plymouth across the street from the Kilcourse mansion and waited. At 9 and a p.m., Mr. Kilcourse, much, much too old for her, came out the front door and flagged down a taxi. I made an illegal U-turn and followed. The trail ended across the Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County. It was a country club-type building on top of a hill overlooking the bay. It did business under the name of Ernie Nogales' Racket Club. The racket had nothing to do with tennis. It came from two sources. The moans and groans of the customers losing money at the roulette wheels and crap tables, and the glad hand the management threw at my quarry as I followed him in. Well, Mr. Kilcore, uh-huh. surprised to see you. Since when you go out after dark? Well, I thought a little nightlife might agree with me, Nogales. Oh, 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 that sounds like you, Mr. Kilcore. <laughs> I didn't know you better. I think you was afraid to go out night. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, I was thinking of buying this place to retire to. Ah. But I figured it'd be cheaper to win it at your roulette table. <laughs> What's your limit here? Ten thousand, but for you, wide open, the sky. Uh, a hot hundred grand for a starter? <laughs> well, any time they catch you with hot money, Mr. Kilko. <laughs> Come over to the cashier. Yeah. I sell you the chips myself. <laughs> I didn't have to bother making myself inconspicuous. Everybody in the joint stopped playing to watch Kilcourse while he shoved his hundred grand roll through the cashier's window and scooped up four stacks of thousand buck chips. Make your bets, please. All right, you. Spin that wheel. Huh? How much you got there? Twenty-five grand. Any objections? Is that okay, Mr. Nogales? Uh, Spin it, Joe. I'm covering through the table personally. Okay, sir. Around and round the little ball goes. Fifteen page, fifteen and the red. Oh. Maybe next time, Mr. Kilgo. Why don't you double up, play the red and the black? It's safer. I'll stay with the numbers. Fifty thousand on fifteen. There, spin it. It's okay, Joe. I'm still covering. Well, it's your money, Mr. Nogales. Number four page, number four and the red again. Well. 
25 grand more on 15. Uh, look, Mr. Kilcoins, go on, enjoy yourself taking off your income tax, but please spend those... Spread them out a little there, those chips, huh? It looks bad for the house. What kind of a joint is this? Can't you cover the bets? Okay, Joe. He asked for it. Okay, sir. <laughs> I didn't wait to see where the little ball went on the last spin of the wheel. I would have made a side bet with any taker that Kilcourse wanted to lose that hundred grand. I would also have made book. He knew I was following him. As I left the table and walked out of the club, I braced myself for what usually comes next. There would either be a dead body in the car or somebody would crease my noggin with a sap. But nothing happened. I switched on the headlights and stood in the glare of them for fully a minute, but nobody even shot at me. I flushed the shrubbery. No gunman. Check the ignition wires. No booby traps. Driving back to town, I racked my brain for some way to bring them out into the open. I felt like a man with his life savings all on one number waiting for the wheel to stop spinning, which wasn't far from the truth. Not much of a cliffhanger, but the best we could do this week. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective... Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. <laughs> And now, back to the hot hundred grand caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Yeah? Uh, this uh, Mrs. Kilcourse's apartment? Yeah. She here? Yeah. Well, uh, can I come in? Yeah. Tommy? Yeah. Who is that, Mr. Spade? Yeah. Oh, this is, this is the detective I was telling you about, Tommy. Remember? Yeah. The one who looked so much like you? Yeah. No. Oh, excuse me. This is my brother, Tommy Lane. Yeah, I mean... Uh... Tommy, won't you run down to the corner and buy me some cigarettes for about 20 minutes? I have something to talk over with Mr. Spade. Yeah. Nice boy, your brother. Small vocabulary, but big feet. Well, he, he's shy. Now, what did you find out about Mr. K uh, my husband, Mr. Spade? He uh, dropped a hundred grand in a gambling joint, Ernie Nogales' racket club. You know it? No, but I know Ernie Nogales. I knew him in Reno before I met Leonard. He lost his license there for running a crooked wheel. The way Kilcourse was playing tonight, that wheel didn't have to be crooked. He was trying to lose that hundred grand. But why? Why would he do a thing like that? One of two reasons. Either he's paying off to Nogales or he's paying off to somebody else and Nogales is the go-between. Well, I don't believe it. Ernie is a crooked gambler, but he doesn't touch blackmail. And your husband isn't stupid enough to drop a hundred grand in three turns of a wheel. Anyway, I'm not tangled with him and or the Ernie Nogales mob for a hundred bucks of your money or anybody else's. Here, take it. Well, but... And here are your car keys. No, no, wait, please. You, you can't desert me now. Why not? Well, I haven't told you everything. I'd hoped I wouldn't have to. About your brother? How did you know? The only place you get a green suntan is in a pokey. Besides, he acts kind of stir-crazy. Spent a little time in solitary, didn't he? He won't talk about it. But that's it, Sam. 
That's why Leonard is paying that blackmail money to Nogales. Uh, you just said Nogales wouldn't touch blackmail. Any other corrections you'd like to make in your copy before we proceed? Yes. Well, I might as well tell you everything. Why not? I knew when I came to you this morning that my husband was paying this money to Nogales. I knew because I asked him to. You and Ernie Nogales are working together? I'm not that rotten. I didn't say you were, but you're a rotten liar. There's that much in your favor. But I'm telling the truth now, Sam. You must believe me. Everything that has happened is my fault. I persuaded Nogales to give my brother a job in his place in Reno. Mm -hmm. They quarreled, and when he got closed down, he, he blamed Tommy. He swore he'd kill him when he got out of prison. That's why I begged my husband to pay him to save Tommy's life. Who did rat on Nogales about that crooked wheel in Reno? I did. That's why I feel responsible. Leonard is so fine, so, so generous... But I can't let him go on paying for my mistake. Yeah, like you said, he's going to run out of money. Look at me, Sam. Do I look like the kind of a woman to whom money means everything in the world? No, but you're looking at me, not at Kilcourse. You're laughing at me. Oh, I know what you think. Perhaps I did make a mistake in marrying Leonard, but he was so kind, so considerate, like my father. Everybody reminds you of your relatives. You don't believe my story. Well, since you asked. Well, all right, then. Here's the truth. I'm really Jack the Ripper's granddaughter. My parents were terribly wealthy. I harpooned my mother in her Beverly Hills swimming pool, set fire to my father with a $50,000 negotiable bond, and eloped with John Wilkes Booth. That brings us up to 1865. Shall I go on? Don't stop. It's great. Oh, get out of here. Get out of here and leave me alone. After you've told me all your secrets, I'm not that rotten. <gasps> you won't help me. You never intended to. Why go on? Torturing. Oh, now, stop that. Please, please. I, I believe you. I believe all your stories. Now, uh, what is my next smart move? Sam, the only way to stop Ernie Nogales is to prove that he's running a crooked wheel. And then he'd pay back all that blackmail money, and, and he wouldn't dare lay a hand on Tommy. Well, it's going to be hard to prove and expensive. Oh, but... I'll have to lose a little on that wheel before I can figure the way it's rigged. How much can you invest? Well, I, I have about a thousand dollars of my own. With you? Yes. Here, you take it. Mmm, smells nice. Sam. Yeah? Sam, after all this is over, and after I've put things to right with Leonard, I should have told him before this, but I owed him so much, I... Oh, Sam, I'm so glad it's you. Yeah, me too, Angel. Go now, darling, before I beg you not to. What time does that joint close? Well, it, well, it runs all night, I think. Good. Let's stay up late and raid the icebox. Around 2 in the a.m., when I low-geared the Plymouth up the long, steep driveway to Ernie Nogales' racket club, backed into the parking space nearest the road with a car headed downhill for a quick getaway, just in case, and I went in. The joint was still going full blast. I bought 500 bucks worth of chips, swaggered over to the table where Kilcourse had dropped his hundred grand and nonchalantly flipped the blue chip onto the red. Appalachia bets, ladies and gentlemen. Make your game. Okay, that's all. Around and round the little ball goes. I didn't look to see where the little ball went. Most of the money was on red, so it was bound to turn up black. A red, please. What? Number 15. Place your bets, please. Make your game, ladies and gentlemen. Around and round it goes. The chips were spread around more the next turn, so I stacked 100 at the bottom of the 1 to 34 column. With a crooked wheel, my 100 made it the best bet to lose. And 19, and the red wins again. Hey! I plunked 500 down on number 5 and raked in 17,500. I left my original bet on the table. When the little ball fell into the pocket, I was 35,000 bucks to the good from my point of view, but not from my clients. I doubled my bet and looked apprehensively around. There were no surly characters edging up behind me. In fact, the only surly character in sight was Ernie Nogales, and he looked happy. That didn't make much sense. When my bankroll got to 105,000, I played a hunch. I threw five grand of it back on the table and lost it. That made a kind of sense. I cashed in the rest of my chips and squeezed the 100 grand U.S. currency into my inside pocket. If anybody aimed for my heart, it was thick enough to stop the slug, which was some comfort. But what I saw when I walked out to the parking lot was no comfort at all. I'd gotten just a glimpse of it through some trees. 
The sedan backed into a driveway halfway down the hill. It was blacked out except for five glowing cigar ends that showed through the windows. I could think of only one reason for five cigar smokers to be parked in that particular spot at that particular moment. The Plymouth is where I had parked it, pointing straight down the hill. I slammed the door but didn't get in. Then I listened. The car down the hill was getting ready, too. I cracked the door of the Plymouth wide enough to get my arm inside and pressed the starter with the heel of my hand. I switched on the lights, pushed the clutch with my left hand, used my right to shift it into low, then I pulled the hand throttle out all the way and let it go. Big idea busting into my office. We're going to have a talk now, Gallus. Please, don't wave that heater at me. It makes me nervous. I don't like guns. I don't either. That's why I'm here. Put your hands on top of the desk and keep them there. All right. Give me back that roll. I give you clean money for it. It was a gamble, so I lost. Can you blame me? Where'd you get this money? I buy it. 50 cents on the dollar. I don't ask where it came from, but I read the papers. I figured it was that ship row, that shipyard payroll job a few days back. Like it just fell in my lap. I figured it'd make 50 grand instead of kill course five. I guess that was dirty trick you just out of stir, Tommy. Huh? I got news for you, Nogales. I didn't know this money was hot, and I am not Tommy Lane. No? Then what? Private Dick. Tommy's sister hired me to take the fall for him. Look, I uh, got most of the cape. But Kilcourse wanted to pay Tommy a hundred grand. You rigged the wheel so Kilcourse would lose it one night and Tommy would win it back the next night. Now, uh, what was Kilcourse paying him off for? No caper, legitimate. He was sent up for bribing a public official. You mean he was the payoff man for Kilcourse's contracting firm? Sure, legitimate business. And the grand jury went out after Kilcourse. Tommy took the rap, that's all, for a price. Yeah, a hundred grand. Thanks, Nogales. That's all I needed. Oh, Sam. I was afraid I might be too late. You are, sweetheart. Oh, I have so many things to explain. Where, 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 where can you talk? Right in here. But who's this man? Why, that's your old sweetie from Reno, Ernie Nogales, remember? What's the matter with you two? You oh, crazy? Oh, Sam, I should have told you the truth from the beginning. Check. The Nogales yarn, I can understand. But why did you tell me you were Kilcross's wife? I was desperate. I had to say something. It was the only explanation I could think of for my interest in this case without uh, telling the truth. But you were making a pigeon out of me. I don't know about such things, Sam. All I know is I'm here in time to warn you. You mustn't walk out of here with that money. Listen, they may you... kill you to get it back. They already did. They're combing the wreckage of that car right now looking for my body. <gasps> then Tommy was right. They did mean to kill him. How did he get the rumble? While he was in prison from another man that killed course framed. He was in for life so it was safe for him to talk. Hey, you two. Oh. Yeah, no, Gallus? That car that just drove up. I think that's Mr. Kilcourse. Oh, I... Hey, what's your let hurry? Me go, let me go! Come on, what's your hurry? Tommy's out there in that cab. I've got to warn him. Or tip off Kilcourse. Which is it? No, Sam, you've got to believe Sit me. Sit down. Oh, Stop that. You two have fun. I'm getting out of here. Go ahead. Now, uh, listen, sweet Lorraine, you may as well save your breath for those explanations. You're staying right here until the cape is all wrapped up. Here he comes. Have you got a gun, Sam? Yeah. Well, you'd better have it ready. Mm -mm. But Sam... There's no Gallus. I want to see him. Uh, he was called out of town, sir. I'm in charge. Uh, you must have killed Cross? That's right. I want to know why you people have been interfering with my business. It might interest you to know that this building site's on an old Spanish land grant. Title's very shaky. I'll run an eight-lane highway straight through the middle of it and turn the rest of it into a game preserve. <laughs> That's what I do to people who double-cross me. I tried to tell Mr. Nogales that, sir. He wouldn't listen to me. He tipped Tommy off for a split of the hundred grand, but I knew sooner or later we'd have to answer to you, Mr. Kilcoss. Oh, well, what's that? Here's your hundred grand, sir. Count it. Sam. Well, 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 well. What's your name, son? Sam Spade, sir. Well, I'm glad to meet an honest lad. Well, come along. Uh, you too, young lady. We'll all walk out together. Sam, shut what up, are you... What? Uh, Spade, huh? Yes, sir. I'm a private detective, but I'm ambitious. Hmm. Politics? Uh, yes, sir. Well, <laughs> we'll run you for assembly. In the meantime, I believe there's an opening in one of the public services. Garbage disposal. Uh, executive end, of course. Uh, where the devil is that man with my car? Oh, there he is. Now, you drop around to my office in the morning. Thank you, and good night, Mr. Kilcross. Uh, drive on, Horace. Back to the city. Oh, Sam. 
How could you? Hmm? All those lies and, and just handing over the money like that. It, it wasn't yours. It wasn't Tommy's either, sweetheart. Get in. Well, Tommy, are you all right? Yeah. Drive us across the bridge, Tommy, will you? Yeah. Tommy. <clears throat> yeah? Tommy, I'm afraid we'll have to do without the money. Yeah? S Sam gave it to Mr. Kilcourse. Yeah. Now, now, don't get excited, Tommy. I'm sure Sam had a reason. Didn't you, Sam? Yeah. I mean, that was marked money from a payroll job. Oh, then it won't do him any good. It'll send him up for a good long stretch if the eyewitness story that goes along with it is good enough. And you're just the girl to tell it, sweetheart. Am I uh, right, Tommy? Yeah. Period, end of report. Already? But, Sam... Yeah? What happened? Who were the five men in the car, the ones who shot at that Plymouth in the mistaken belief that you were in it? Their names are of little account, Effie. Suffice it to say that Kilcors pointed his pudgy finger at them in the hopes of keeping the charge of attempted murder out of his indictment. But I was too clever. I identified them. But, Sam, you didn't see anything but their cigars glowing in the darkness. Have you never heard of Sherlock Holmes' monograph on the 49 varieties of tobacco ash, you oh, fool? Oh, but, Sam, Sherlock Holmes is only the segment of someone's imagination. He's a fictional detective. Well? You mean... Oh, Sam, you're tired. Yes, I am. It's affected your mind, well. winning all that money. Now, you just sit here and rest. Oh, all right. Think of the snowy mountaintops and uh, blue skies. Mm -hmm. I'll just go and type this up. Snowy mountaintops. Winter sports yet. And now, listen to this. If you haven't yet tried Wild Root Cream Oil, the famous hair tonic that grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff, then here's a wonderful way to get acquainted. Buy Wild Root Cream Oil in the new 25-cent size bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. And not that it made any difference, but how did you guess that she wasn't Mrs. Kilcourse? Simple. Kilcourse didn't recognize her. But Sam, that was after you denounced her. I did no such thing. From the report, Sam, in black and white. Quote, why did you tell me you were Kilcourse's wife? Unquote. At that point, you assumed that she was not Mrs. Leonard Kilcourse. I did not. I merely wondered why she had told me. Well, with all the lies she told, you might have assumed anything she said was totally devoid of truth. And I did, sweetheart. I did. Oh. Oh, well, that's a relief. I was afraid for a while she'd taken you in. What's that got to do with the truth? Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Sadie Thompson appeared as Lorraine Kilcourse. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Score composed by Renee Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.